How are we doing, Cross Point? Well, Happy New Year to all of you. Let's hear that back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Man, so good to see all of you. And can I just be honest? I am absolutely baffled. The worse the weather gets, the more you people come out. Uh, I'm just absolutely impressed with Cross Pointers. Kansas Tough, that's who you guys are. Uh, so thankful that you're here. We're getting ready to kick off a brand new series. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, maybe you're a guest or maybe you've just never paid attention before. My name is Andy, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here. We're a multi site church. We have campuses across the state of Kansas, and we're so thankful that each and every one of us are joined together in this family that we call our church. And as we kick off this new series, it's called DIY, and I'll explain it in a moment, but it's uh, a do it yourself series, but it's uh, all about how to wreck your life. Does that sound encouraging to everybody else? How to wreck your life. We'll get on with that in just a minute, but I want to celebrate something. We had been pushing for the last, oh, five weeks during the Christmas season, during the holidays, on being thinking or being a congregation that thinks outside ourselves and giving towards a mission goal. And, and at a difficult time when, when people's expenses are high and, dif- and it was difficult anyway, we set a pretty aggressive goal of about $25,000 to raise over five weeks, above and beyond everything else. And I'm here to tell you that as a congregation, not only have you been continuing to give towards the regular ministries of the church, you've been giving towards Exceed to help the building program, but you as a church raised $31,000 plus for mission. Give yourselves a hand. I'm so proud of how generous we are as a people, how great you step up to the plate. And that's all. Every penny of that's going to be sent out to mission work and doing incredible things from as close as here in our own state to all the way around the world. It's just fantastic. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Well, now let's get on to this series, DIY, how to destroy, how to wreck your life and do it yourself. Obviously, no one wants to wreck their life. If you do, that's a whole other program. And uh, that's, we're not here to self-destruct. It's kind of a comedic take. And the message that I want to bring to you this weekend is actually where this came from. A matter of fact, the fall of 2012, so quite a while ago, I was reading in Scripture and I found this passage and I actually taught a little bit of it in our midweek service, and it began to build something in my system that that I thought this would be a great way to approach a a beginning of the year issue. This would be a great way to kind of tackle some change. And so we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about specific topics on how to wreck your life. Now, the purpose is not that you would get there, but that you would keep from wrecking your life. Look at whoever you're sitting next to and say, make sure you understand. Go ahead and tell them. And make sure you understand it. We're giving you what the Bible could teach us on how to wreck your life in hopes that we won't do it, and all God's people said. Amen. So we're going to be looking at different topics, and, and today we're going to be looking at the issue, if you've already looked in your notes, how to make a bad decision. And some of you are probably thinking, I don't need any help with that at all. I've made bad decisions on my own without any instruction. Well, the whole purpose of looking at how to make a bad decision is because if we haven't made bad decisions, or even if we have made a ton of bad decisions, knowing the architecture of where bad decisions come from might help us. If we can biblically understand how we should make decisions, it's going to help us whether we're good decision makers or bad decision makers. And all God's people said... So that's what we're going to do. And and I want to make a statement that's not in your notes. It was kind of a thought that developed as I was thinking about what to share with you. And it was simply this. Decision is direction. I want you to say those three words with me. Decision is direction. One more time. Say it. Decision is direction. It's all about trajectory. And for those of you who've been with me for the last 10 years or so, you know I talk about this concept all the time because it's really a big deal to me. Let me try and illustrate this for you. And, and this is going to be not to scale. I'll explain it in just a moment. But this is the earth right here. And this is the moon. Now, I don't know what you know about this, but I check my sources with several pastors because whenever pastors do math, you need at least 10 of them to get this right. Um, But the moon itself is about 1,079 miles across. That's its width, its radius. The distance between the earth and the moon is roughly 240,000 miles. Now, if I did this right, I uh, I, I need to share with you that for this to be even close to scale, you would have to imagine this image 240 times wider. Now, I can't put that on a chart for you to understand. So to get the distance, you really need to imagine that this screen is 240 miles or 240 pages further across. Now, what's really interesting, at 1,079 miles as a target, with a distance of 240,000 miles to travel, and we check this, that if you get one, everybody say one, one. If you get one degree off, 
you're going to miss the one degree. You're going to miss the moon, not by just a, a little notch like I show you there. You're going to miss the moon by tens of thousands of miles. One degree. Everybody say one degree. One degree. You one degree off, you're going to miss the moon by tens of thousands of miles. As I was sharing this, Matt, our worship pastor, he, he shared that he had done a similar experiment at one point in time, and, and they had discovered that if you were taking a gun and you were shooting at a target 20 feet away and you were one inch off, you will miss the target by eight feet. One inch at 20 feet makes you miss by, are you seeing the importance of trajectory? The place that you mean, decision is direction. Say that with me again. Decision is direction. When you make decisions, you are plotting a course for your life. When you, when you make a decision, you are choosing a direction to go. And that's why it is so important. Everybody say, so important. so important. It's absolutely so important. Now, with that as the background, let me get us into this. And I want to make a couple of statements, things that you may or may not believe at this point. But I'm going to try and convince you of it. First of all, you are a good decision maker. Some of you out there going, no, I, make, I don't make good decisions. I, I just don't do that. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, you are a good decision maker. Tell them. I didn't hear a lot of truth in that. I heard, I heard some of you looking and going, well, maybe you. I, let me tell you why. Here's, here's how I know. You make thousands of decisions every day. You think, oh, I've messed up so many decisions. But it's, it's not true. You make thousands of decisions every day. The fact that you showed up here fully clothed <laughs> is a testament to the fact that you are a good decision maker. And all God's people said. I mean, all those little things, every decision that you make proves that you're a good decision maker. A second thing about trajectory, you need to understand that not only are you a good decision maker, you have that capacity, you have that ability, but our decisions are like dominoes. Say that with me. Our decisions are like dominoes. Have you ever tried to eat healthy? Anybody ever tried? No, no I never even tried any. Huh? Maybe you're not the good decision maker. <laughs> no, you're a good decision maker. And if you've ever tried to eat healthy, here's what happens. If you start off well, you do well. If you get up in the morning and have low-fat almond milk on your rice bran, whatever it is that you're going to eat, then you're probably going to do better for the rest of the day. If you have a Krispy Kreme, <laughs> then what happens at lunch? You're like, well, nah, I already blew it. And what you're saying is trajectory is off. I'll, I'll relaunch tomorrow. Direction, decisions are like dominoes. I want you to say, decision is direction. Say it. Decision is direction. And decisions are dominoes. Say it with me. Dec decisions are dominoes. So we understand this point, and here is the final issue before we get into our text. The final issue is this, that when it comes to making decisions, we need to make decisions before we have to make decisions. You see, most of the time we get in trouble because we get put in a moment where, oh, now I have to make a decision. But as a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, he has given us the ability to know what we should decide depending on the circumstance that we're in. Does that make sense? So before you get in that situation where you have to decide, would I spend my money on this? You've decided already, this is what we spend our money on. Before you get in a position, will I start a relationship like this? You've already said, no, I don't do crazy. We're not going to start a relationship like this. And we make the decision first. The decision comes first. It's the decision before the decision. I want you to say that with me. The decision before the decision. Guys, the trajectory of your life, the direction of your life, the domino of the directions that you make, and the fact that, that our decisions need to be decided before we get in that moment. This is why it's so important that we figure out how we make bad decisions. And all God's people said. Now, I know what's happening right now. I can see it on so many of your faces. You're already going, I wish I heard this five years ago. <laughs> or I wish I'd listened to that. Or I wish, I wish I knew this before. No regrets. Wherever you are right now, God forgives our past. God heals our wounds. God stands us up tall. It's a matter of what we do from this moment forward. And all God's people said, Amen. it's time we start learning to make some good decisions. And how are we going to do that? We're going to learn about how to wreck your life by making bad decisions the biblical way. Let's pray. Then we're going to jump into the text. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your word. I pray that you would not let this pastor mess up what your perfect word has to teach. 
God, we want to hear from you. We want to be moved by you. We want to be moved in you. So help us now to get the skills to make decisions before we have to make decisions, to to decide what's important, to, to go ahead and choose which direction we'll go. And then when life comes at us, let us be ready. God, use this preacher. I am confessing to you and all those who are here, still lost, still broken, still in need, still full of lusts and greeds and pride. I pray that you would work through my frailty as you always have done in each and every one of our lives and let your spirit teach us all something new. For it's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people said. I want to take you to one of the worst decision makers in Scripture. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 15. We've been in the Christmas story for so long, we're going to jump now to the Easter story. We're going to move to the end of Christ's life. And and let me just put you at a place where you can know the background and the drama that's going on. Jesus has already been through the Last Supper. He's been handed over. He's been already abused by his own people. And now he's been handed over to the Roman government in hopes that they will get rid of him for them. They don't want Jesus around. They don't like his grace. They don't like his mercy. They don't like the fact that he's overturning tables in the temple. They don't like it. So they want the Romans to kill him. And they put, uh, put him in a situation where now the Roman prefect, the guy who's in charge of the area, his name is Pilate, he has to decide what to do with him. Now, if you don't know what's going on here, I have a real soft spot in my heart for, for Pontius. Now, he was a Gentile. He didn't care too many things about who Jesus was or what was going on, but he wanted to do the right thing, and he made a poor decision. So with that as the background, here's what's happening in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 6. Now, at the feast... He used, he being Pilate. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Pause on the background here. What he always did at this particular season on the Jewish calendar is to try and show the grace and mercy of Rome is they would release one prisoner as just somebody that they could say as a token, see, we're full of grace and mercy. And so that's where they're at. Jesus is up for this as a potential and he thinks this will get me out of it because I always release somebody anyway. Verse 7, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them, which means to release one of the prisoners. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews, which is what he was calling Jesus, not Barabbas. For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him released, to have him, Barabbas, not Jesus, to have Barabbas released. Uh, it, I, it said that already. I don't know why I corrected that. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him released for them, Barabbas, instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? Do you see the soft spot you can have in your heart for Pilate right there? He's trying to do, he says, I got nothing against this guy, but listen to what happens. What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now there's your background. This was a poor decision, and all God's people said. He wanted to do the right thing. He had the ability to do the right thing, but he did the wrong thing. He made a bad decision. Now, what is the architecture of this decision? How can we learn from his mistake? How to make a bad decision? Here's the first thing that you're going to do if you're going to make a bad decision. You are going to make an assumption. If you go back to the text, what did it say? For he perceived, everybody say perceived. I don't think you're into this. Let me help you out. You're going to really appreciate this one because you're going to be able to use this on somebody. Here we go. Everybody say perceived. Perceived. He perceived. He made an assumption. We all get in this little spot every now and then where we think we know everything. Well, I understand what's going on here. I know what they're thinking. I know what she's saying behind my back. I know what they're doing down there. And when we get in that place, that is the first step to getting your trajectory off. One, two, 20 degrees. And now you're headed in the direction of a bad decision. You've got to make sure you know what's going on and you don't make assumptions. Everybody say, don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions. You know, we had an incredible Christmas Eve service uh, just a week or so ago. I mean, it was so much fun. It was, it was so good. And thanks, thank you for bringing friends and family and coming out to that. 
setting up for it is quite an ordeal. Not for me anymore. I mean, because our staff's been great. They just say, Andy, you do your thing. We're going to do ours. And, and I kind of feel bad about that because I used to be real hands-on with all that. I was there setting up stuff and I was like, just, just go. And, and so my wife and I decided that we knew there was a crew that was setting up and getting ready and doing sound and light checks and all that noise. So we went by and we got them lunch. We just got a bunch of uh, Little Caesars pizzas and, and some pop. We just thought, we'll just take it over to them and, and give them a, a little bit of a break. And my wife's carrying in the pizzas, and I got the pop, and my boys are in tow. You know, we're come walking in. It's so much fun. And, and as we get there, people light up. Oh, there it is. And one of our staff members, who will remain nameless for the reason that I'm about to share with you, he saw Kathy carrying in those Little Caesars pizzas, and he goes, there she is, hot and ready. <laughs> and you could see on his face, oh, no. Oh, no. And everybody in the room just stopped and went, what'd you say? And I was like, what'd he say? Hot and red. Oh, wait. It's on the box. I understand. Now, you could get in trouble if you make an assumption right there. And all God's people say, amen. let's get a better amen if we try that one more time. You get in trouble if you make an assumption right there. Amen. You have to know, you have to know that's not what he meant. That's not what he wanted to say. That's not what he wanted to have perceived. It's on the box. It's completely understandable. But if you make an assumption, you can throw yourself into quite a tizzy real quick. Amen? When you don't have all the information, when you don't check out the sources, when you don't give the benefit of the doubt, there's so many things that go into making a bad decision. The first one comes when you say, mm, I don't need it anymore. Mm, I don't need to hear from you. Mm, I don't care what you have to say. Mm, I don't and you begin to make assumptions, and you begin to perceive things. I got news for you. Just write this one down somewhere. You are not God. And because you're not God, you don't know everything. Some of you have been waiting a long time to do this. Whoever you're sitting next to will say, you don't know everything. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> you don't know everything. Didn't that feel good? <laughs> Try that in another direction. Just pick somebody you don't even know and tell them. That's good. You don't know anything. Yeah, that feels good. This will feel even better. Ready? I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, I, I don't, don't know, know everything. everything. Let's try that one more time. I, I don't, don't know, know everything. everything. And when we act like we do, when we act like we know more than we actually know, that's the first step to a bad decision. And all God's people said Pilate perceived, and it got him in trouble. Here's the second thing that he did. He said, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, who is them? The chief priest. Now, these guys are the ones who were trying to stir up all the trouble in the first place. It says so right there. You know what the second mistake that he made was? When you count on the wrong people. We make bad decisions because we have bad advisors. We go to the wrong sources, the wrong people the wrong channels, the wrong web pages. We go to all the wrong places. We're looking for love. In, I'm singing that song all the time, aren't I? We've got to make sure that if we're going to make a bad decision, that we've got to go to the wrong people. That's what it means to make a bad decision. You've got to, go to, the, you've got to count on the wrong people. We were doing a cross-country trip. My, uh, I grew up, not grew up, I was born and spent most of my summers in Southern California. I was born just outside of Los Angeles, and that's where all my family's from. And, and so we would make an annual pilgrimage uh, in the family truckster all the way to, uh, to California. It was a three-day trip out, three-day trip back. Got to spend almost three days there. You know how that is. Uh, and so we, we spent a lot of time on the road. I'm the oldest of three brothers, and I remember, I remember quite clearly one time my, my middle brother, he, uh, we stopped at a rest stop, and it was like a rest stop under construction. They didn't even have the facilities there. It was a beautiful picture place. We set up, I think we had lunch there at a pavilion, but then the, the restrooms were just porta-potties lined up on the highway. And, um, and he said he had to go to the bathroom, and as they usually do, they send the older one, go, go with your brother, make sure he's okay. And so, all right, and I walked over to the porta-potty with him, and I waited, and he went in, and I noticed, you know how you can tell on a porta-potty? And there's just like 12 of them lined up looking at the highway, and there's just cars going by, all kinds of people. And you know how you can tell on a porta-potty whether they lock the door or not? You know, it says vacant or not vacant. Well, this, my, my little brother did not lock the door. And I thought, he must be taught a lesson. <laughs> Those of you who went, <laughs> you're older siblings. Those of you who went, no, you're younger siblings. 
What took place then was hilarious. As I grabbed the door and just held it open for all the world to see while he sat there on the inside screaming, Andy, Andy, Andy. It was wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I know you're thinking that's not right. Well, that's because you're a younger child. <laughs> all the older children were thinking, I wish I had that opportunity. <laughs> you know what my brother did? He counted on the wrong people. You know what my parents did? They counted on the wrong people. It is too, your life is too important to count on the wrong people. Can I get a better amen if I try? Your decision, your marriage, your parenting, your career, your faith, your heart, your life, it is too important for you to count on the wrong people in the wrong places at the wrong time. Amen. And Pilate, Man, in making the biggest decision of his life, whether he knew it or not, he counted on the people who were dead set on making everybody in this scenario do the wrong thing. You know, I'm amazed that when our marriages are in trouble, the people that we go to. I'm amazed when our faith is in trouble, the things that we listen to. We need to be very careful. Everybody say, very careful. Be very careful that when we're making decisions that we're going to people and places that we should count on. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Let me give you the third step to making a bad decision. The first thing that he did, obviously, was made assumptions. The second thing was that he counted on the wrong people. And then I think if there is one key element to making a bad decision, here it is. In verse 14. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Here's the third thing. This will get you. If you get the other two right and you get this one wrong, you're still going to make a bad decision. It's focusing on making people happy. When you focus on making people happy, when you, when you make your, you your decision-making based on what others are going to think and what they're going to say, you're going to fall down almost every time. Your trajectory is going to be off. You're going to miss by miles and miles and miles. You say, well, what about good people? What about godly people? There are some people who want the best for you. There are some people who might, but they, they are human beings as flawed and frail as you. Look at your neighbor go, go, mm-hmm, just go, mm-hmm. They are flawed and frail as you. And if your decision-making is an attempt to make them happy, it's going to put you on the wrong track because you're trying to satisfy. Even if they have the best, listen, even if they have the best advice and they're people you can count on, even if they have you in mind, even if they are godly out the wazoo, the reality is that your focus is wrong when your focus is on making them happy. Does that make sense? Now, we see this because he was wishing to, that was what tipped the scales for him, because he wanted to make everybody happy, so he just did. If you don't know the rest of the story, you know his wife, his pagan wife, was woke up with a dream, and in the dream, she was warned that her husband should not do anything to this man. He came, she came to him and said, don't do anything to that man. He had conflict. He couldn't find anything wrong with him. His wife was all over him saying, don't do anything. But these people that he listened to, because he wanted to make them happy. He went against everything else that was screaming out, don't do this. You ever been down that road? Hmm. It all depends on who you're trying to make happy. I, I work out with a trainer because this kind of body doesn't just happen. <laughs> hmm. Aren't you glad I gave you permission to laugh at that? <laughs> I work out with a trainer, and I won't give his name because I, he needs to continue to have business, and I'm not exactly a good advertisement for him. Um, but I, I work out with a trainer, and uh, I find it amazing. When I work out on my own, because here's the plan. They work out with you, and then they tell you to go work out. When I work out, and I kind of develop my own plan, you're supposed to do this, this, this. Man, I'm, I'm pretty legit, you know what I mean? I can stand in front of the mirror, mm, do, oh, and I look pretty good, and I feel good about myself. And, and then I work out with the trainer. And when I work out with the trainer, I do little bits of weight in very funny positions, and I feel like a kindergarten girl is what I feel like. I don't know how that works because when, when I'm by myself, man, I'm just like <laughs> big weight. And I started processing it. Here's what's going on. I do, when I'm by myself, when I'm trying to satisfy myself, when I'm trying to look good in my own eyes, man, I do stuff I know I can do. And I always look good in the mirror doing that. And because I know I can do it, I can do bigger weight and I feel good about it. And as long as I'm trying to satisfy myself, guess what? This is all I'm ever going to get. 
But when you work out with a trainer and that guy's standing over you going, 10 more, I was wrong, 25 more. No, keep going, you can do this. And, and, and you're trying, you know, he made a statement. I said, man, every time I work out with you, I can't decide whether I love you or hate you. And he said, if your workouts were easier when, I wa- if your workouts were easier when I'm here, then I'm not doing my job. And that was the absolute truth because I know when he's standing over me, when he's got the stopwatch, when he's writing stuff down, I'm trying to please him. And when that happens, I'm moving farther forward. I'm, I'm making progress, which is going to lead to a transition for us because you said, Andy, aren't, aren't we supposed to not make other people happy? Yeah, but that other people includes you. Can I try that one more time? When I say when you focus on making people happy, that's a, that's a, a bad decision-making ploy. One of those people I'm talking about is you. If your decisions are made simply to make you happy, 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 (laughs) then the reality is you're going to fall down. You want to know why? Because happy is a grease pig and (laughs) one day it will get away from you. Happy is a circumstance. You can chase it and you'll chase it your whole life and never quite get there. So what do we have to do? Now listen, we've got the architecture for a bad decision. We're going to make assumptions, we're going to count on the wrong people, and we're going to focus on making people happy, and I am one of those people. So how do you do it right? Now, real quick, let's walk through this. The first thing, and these are just the counters to the three that we already talked about, is this. Don't make assumptions, but discover the truth. You have to discover the truth. You have to be an investigator. You have to be a student of circumstances. And when it's time for you to make a decision, and not a little decision, like what should I have for breakfast? I mean, that one you can make pretty easy. Look at the nutrition label and go for it. Does that make sense? But on these bigger issues, what do you do? What what, what do you, listen, there is truth. It's not X-Files kind of truth, but the truth is out there. Does that make sense? You have to find the truth. Everybody say, find the truth. truth. Do you know what? There's a difference between algebra truth and word of God truth. There is truth in algebra, but nobody cares. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Except a couple math teachers out there. And there's truth in it. It's true, but it doesn't do you any good on a regular basis. Don't get on me, but I know if we didn't have algebra, we'd die. Shut it. <laughs> and algebra doesn't really help your relationships. It doesn't calm your nerves. It doesn't bring peace to your soul. But the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. We discover truth. Everybody say truth. Truth Truth with a capital T in God's Word. Because in God's Word, we find principles and premises and powers and things that can actually bring healing and hope to our lives. And so what do we have to do? We don't make assumptions, but we work at discovering the truth. Here's the second thing. We don't count on the wrong people but we rely on God and His Word. We rely on God and His Word. You, now listen, there are all kinds of people that you should listen to. People with godly influence, people with a godly background, and they're going to have something for you. But the reality is you have to make God first. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, but seek first. Everybody say first. First, first His kingdom and His righteousness, and then everything else is going to be added unto you. you got to make that first. It's kind of like guacamole. Man, I love guacamole. Anybody love guacamole? If you don't, you're wrong. I love guacamole. You know why I love guacamole? It's because I love avocados. I just told you I was born in California. It's a state law. You have to love avocados if you're born in California. I love avocados, and therefore I love guacamole. But if you're going to make a good guacamole, and if you want me to make you a guacamole, I'm going to make you a good guacamole. I, I can do this for you. When you make a good guacamole, you must start with the first ingredient, and that is... You can't start with anything else. Now, you, to taste, you, you may put some onion in there. I like a little bit of onion in mine. You can put any different kind of seasoning packet that you want. Actually, I just like, you know, the, the, the Creole seasoning, which I know is two, two genres, but it's really good. Put that in there. Some people put tomato in there, but I don't do that because I believe tomato was the first fruit that Adam and Eve ate from the tree. It's, it's not of God. Uh, <laughs> and so you, you put all kinds of different stuff in there. But it's not guacamole if you don't start with the avocado, Right? What if you start with applesauce? Yeah, dip your corn chip in that. Does that sound good? What if you start with mayonnaise? (laughs) 
You could start with all kinds of stuff, but if you do not start with avocado, anything else you put into is going to destroy it. Anything else isn't going to help it. You've got to start. And what I'm getting at is for you and I, not only do we discover the truth, but you have to rely on God and His Word first. Are there good books you can read? Yes, but God and His Word first. Are there good small group members that you can rely on? Yes, but God and His Word first. You have to put it first or it all falls apart. So when you're making, you say, but my pastor said this. You know what? If your pastor ever tells you something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, your pastor's wrong. Amen. If your friend, if your grandma, if your, if your employer, if your mentor ever says something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, then they're wrong. I'm just going to say it straight up. And if we're going to make a good decision, not a bad decision, then we discover the truth and we rely on God and His Word first. Everybody say first. first. Finally, we don't live to please ourselves or anyone else we live to please Jesus now this is probably if you don't get any you, you know what you could throw the rest of the notes away if you would start to live by this principle you're going to naturally by attrition start making better decisions if you did just this everybody say just this, just this. if you did just this you're going to make better decisions I've given you a couple of verses from Hebrews from Matthew I'm going to go back to Matthew and I want you to let this simmer on who you are listen in Matthew chapter 8 Verse 22, Jesus is talking about making decisions. He's talking about making decisions before you make decisions, just like we started. Here's what he says. Now when Jesus saw, excuse me, that's the wrong verse. Uh, there it is. Now when Jesus saw a great crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. In other words, he says, I'm, I'm going to make a decision. And Jesus challenges him on it. Verse 20. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. This is a hard teaching from Jesus Christ. Let me break it down for you. Here's what he says. I'll follow you, Lord. If you follow me, that means you're willing to give up everything else. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be like the foxes who live in holes and birds who have nests. Actually, we'll be even less. We'll be like you. We'll be homeless. We'll, be, we'll just follow you in here. But let me go bury my father first. Not only will you give up everything, you will make Jesus your primary relationship. Let the dead bury the dead. You want to know why Christians get so messed up? It's because we have an and one philosophy. I trust Jesus and my mama. I read the book and I watch Oprah. <laughs> I pray and I get advice from my small group. Are you all following me on this? The key to making good decisions, how do you do it right? Is that you live to please Jesus. You know how you know you're about to have an affair? I know it sounds like I'm switching gears really fast, but I can tell you, you know how you know you're about to have an affair? Because you already are. You're having an affair in your heart and in your mind. The affair long, long precedes any physical interaction. You start having an affair in your heart and mind when you get up and you look in the mirror and your thought is, I wonder what he's going to think about this if I wear this today. Or I wonder what she's going to think if I look like this today. The minute you start dressing, acting, talking, buying, doing anything to please somebody else, you're already in love with them. And you're in a dangerous, everybody say dangerous. Dangerous, dangerous spot. When you get up in the morning and you dress because you say, mm, I look good. And you please yourself. You, I know this is going to sound funny, but you're already having an affair against the Lord with yourself. You want to make good decisions? Then every decision, everybody say every decision. every decision. What would Jesus think? What would Jesus have me do? What would he have me say? What would he have me give? Where would he have me serve? What would he have me invite? God, talk to me, tell me, lead me. I'm in your word. You are the priority. How do I please Jesus? Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, killed Jesus. We, wishing to satisfy the Lord, will live for Him. And all God's people said, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. And I pray right now that you would give the grace necessary for us to forgive others their bad decisions, to forgive ourselves of the bad decisions that we've made in the past. Father, as well, I ask that you would give us the strength to move in the direction of making the right decisions, of moving in the right way. Please let the spirit of Pilate be no longer over our lives, our homes, our jobs, our decisions. May we truly embrace what we have seen here. May we run from bad decision making. And may we, may we run straight into your arms. May we live for Jesus. Live to please him each and every day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said.